Let's get right into it. You only have 20 minutes. I just wanted to say uh, thank you for coming on. This is wonderful. It's wonderful to have you. Unfortunately, the circumstances in where you are here uh, are, are not so great, such as just American politics, though. Obviously, what we knew that was going to happen for a month now finally happened. Uh, the Supreme Court came down with a decision on Roe v. Wade and uh, functionally allowed states to decriminalize, or I mean, states to criminalize abortion. Many states already had trigger laws in place. Uh, many states right. already had pre-existing laws in place, and they have already activated. Alabama, for example, has uh, already started turning away people that are seeking abortions or were slated to get abortions in the state of Alabama. And uh, that's where we're at. But I wanted to I wanted to talk to you because you are, well, one, you are at the uh, New York Times. So obviously you understand American politics a lot better than me, a dumbass on Twitch. And I wanted to hear your perspective on what can be done in this circumstance. Yeah, no, it, it's tough because what we're what we're witnessing is the culmination. That's not even the culmination, the very beginning of an effort to roll back not just abortion rights or the right to privacy that the court found in Griswold v. Connecticut, but really roll back almost a hundred years of jurisprudence that was more or less designed to allow Americans to live as they please and to give the federal state an active role in the economy and social life. So this is, I think this should be understood as, as the very beginning. And because it is, it, it took 30 years to get to the point, 40 years to get to the point where re Republicans could put six justices, six hard right conservative justices on the court. In terms of what can be done in the immediate term to kind of reverse this and and push back against it. There's not all that much, right? Obviously, for uh, women on the ground, for anyone who needs reproductive health care on the ground, there are organizations and there are activists working as hard as they can to keep the lines of access open. States like New York and California and Illinois and, and Washington, you know, the big progressive states, um, are likely going to, if they haven't already, if they haven't already codified a right to an abortion in their state constitutions. They're going to, they're going to try to um, uh, improve access. The federal government can do things, right? The U.S. military can uh, continue to pay for service members to uh, access reproductive health care. Um, places where Congress has control, the Washington, D.C., well, Washington, D.C., federal territories can continue to have abortion services. But that's all kind of rear guard action stuff in terms of just actually trying to really reverse the tide in the in the immediate term um there are a couple avenues i think progressives liberals people who support these rights can can do they can start working on trying to amend state constitutions which is an under i think kind of an underrated aspect of all of this but even if even if the federal constitution no longer protects the right to an abortion it is still possible to amend state constitutions to affirm rights to privacy to even affirm a right to an abortion and it's unclear to me, at least, how successful or unsuccessful that would be. But I think it's an approach worth taking. There's one. There's one thing I want to say. In yeah. theory, right? The Supreme Court, like, there, the Constitution doesn't actually say all that much about what the Supreme Court can do, and what its powers are, and the powers it has are kind of the result of things that, that's accumulated over time. The Con Constitution does say that Congress can create a Supreme Court. Congress can determine its size. Congress can determine its jurisdiction. Congress can determine. Yeah how actually the court can overrule stuff. And so medium term to long term, I, I really think it's important for liberals and progressives to be organizing around kind of disciplining and getting a handle on the court. Yeah, uh, there is unfortunately, as far as I understand, not really anything that is uh, closely resembling the Federalist Society on the liberal side. Even the liberal side itself is uh, is a little bit more complicated. There's certainly not one on like the workers side, even liberal Supreme Court justices that were appointed under liberal uh, democratic presidents have still oftentimes sided on the side of corporations and like really ridiculous decisions. So I don't even know if that's something that we can get to, even if there was interest from like a capitalist, but uh, pro democratic right. party, <laughs> pro civil rights uh, businesses that uh, funnel their funds together in a similar capacity to these like psychotic reactionary billionaires and millionaires do. And I don't even know, but that's also long term solutions potentially, and that would take a long time. Obviously, the idea that uh, Democrats have across the border to fundraise off this and then also turn around immediately fundraise off of this, which is so disgusting, in my opinion, uh, and, and basically gives the game away. 
And also just to tell you, like, you just got to vote. And we know if you follow politics even a little bit, as I was describing earlier, you already know that uh, that the, the way that the Senate is uh, created and the way that state legislatures are created, this is before we even get to the judicial branch, it's heavily slanted in the favor of Republicans as a consequence of gerrymandering and state legislatures. And also uh, the Senate is just unequal regardless, right? So that has created a system where like it would not take one election, but it would take multiple elections probably over the course of like 20 years, if not longer, for there to ever even be a Democratic supermajority. So I can't see any way for further in this process than uh, abolishing the filibuster, which comes with complications, certainly. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, in, in the in the short term, if, 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 if you want to maintain like the current rules of the game, then yes, it's going to take forever if you can even manage it to get the kind of super majorities and whatever to reshape the entire judiciary really begin to push back on things. But if you can sort of if you can, in addition to building, you know, broad base from below movements for reproductive rights and really connecting that to existing movements for civil rights for labor rights and also use that kind of energy to begin to build a consensus within you know the democratic party about getting rid of the filibuster about court reform then i, I think in the more medium term you might be able to make some changes via voting in terms of this election year right i think that the most democrats could do like the most that you could do electorally is basically say to the voting public and not even not not do the whole like oh you got to vote more and come vote for us and we'll protect your rights it's these vague statements that you can re re renege on what you need to do or what democrats need to be pressured into saying is right now republicans are a threat to your fundamental rights we are at we are at risk losing the house and the senate if you want the federal government to pass a bill protecting the right to an abortion you need to elect Democrats in these states, in these states, in these states. If you do that, then on the first day of the first session next year, we will pass that bill. And that's it. Just lay it out for voters. If you do X, Y will happen. I'm not saying that's going to work, but I am saying that that's the kind of appeal that might actually reach people. Not sort of broad and vague, we're going to stand up and fight for you, but we need X number of people to do Y thing. Yeah. For whatever reason... Democratic politicians don't like to talk like that. Republicans certainly do. Republicans oh, yeah. say, vote, vote for us and we'll do X, Y, and Z. And then they, they do it. Oh, always. All, I mean, and, and the pure projection of the Republican Party is also really funny because they always talk about activist judges, right? But, like, but the Federalist Society is literally created with the express purpose of creating activist judges to fill the lower courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. And they're very successful at it. And yet they still are able to project and make it seem like Democrats are doing this, but Democrats are so feckless and cowardly that they can't even uh they can't even actually just like come out and say exactly what they want to do but ultimately you're, you're basically still saying that like you know it, the only path forward is just to vote and i'm wondering if there's like i always say democrats should operate like the way republicans do and i hate the democratic party for operating uh, ideologically like the republicans do or at least like working in a very coward cowardly manner you know uh, engaging in, in negligent behavior but i mean like operate like the Republicans do in the same way that like Republicans will whip votes no matter what. They will get things done no matter how unpopular it is. They will sidestep Congress as they have done. They will re revert it back to the state legislatures. They will, uh, you know, move move things along the, the judicial branch like uh, and, and, and get things done, basically. And, and, uh, and they operate in a very strategic manner and can even uh, undermine something that 75% of Americans or 64% of Americans believe should be the law of the land. Is there nothing that like, uh, I don't know, is there nothing that the Democrats could do in a theoretical world where they do actually approach the subject like the way the Republicans do? Like, I don't know. I think someone brought up, it might've been you on Sam Cedar, someone was telling me earlier that uh, you said something along the lines of like uh, federal land, uh, basically utilizing federal land, which exists in like every state as like, uh, you know, de facto protected abortion uh, clinics. Yeah, like yeah. Open up abortion clinics on federal land in every single state and then protect it. I feel like that's something that uh, is is effective, right? I mean, I mean, if the de if, if if congressional Democrats were willing to play hardball, right? Like if if the entire caucus were unified in wanting to a defend abortion rights and just didn't really care anymore about protecting, you know, whatever norms, then what they would do is on the legislative side, I mean, the whole the whole opening clinics on federal land thing is what you do when you have really no other options. But, but because we don't. Democrats 
De- I mean, but you're, you're asking me kind of blue skying it. And because Democrats can still control Congress, I mean, they still do, then you abolish the filibuster, you pass a bill protecting abortion rights, codifying the status quo under Roe um, into law. And then because they keep the Supreme Court from doing anything about it, you like expand the Supreme Court. You add, you know, there are nine justices now. There are 13 circuits. Add four additional justices, 13 justices, 13 circuits, and the four are Democratic appointees. So you have a 7-6 court that's going to uphold your bill. And at that point, you know, no more filibuster, support of Supreme Court, pass voting rights legislation, like do whatever you need to do. Um, that That's like the hardball approach to all of this. And that's sort of in terms of the electoral game, I think the electoral game is uh, trying to shape the Democratic Party to create a consensus for that kind of action. But I don't think the only game in town is the electoral game. I think game i think that as was the case for the initial expansion of these rights in the middle of the 20th century this is a game of broad-based social movements right and i think we should look at the resurgence of the labor movement we should look at sort of civil rights movements reproductive rights movements as sort of moving in tandem um to building the kind of power to act on to act on the national government and act on state governments as well i mean i think i think that in the medium to long term um it is very it is very it is not it is not a good idea to depend on a political party. You need to depend on the social movements that can make political parties act. And that's generally been the case for all kinds of large scale cha- change. That's the case for the reactionaries, right? Like yeah. the, the reason the Republican Party has been so successful is that there's been a broad based social movement behind it trying to make this outcome happen. There is. So we we absolutely agree on that point, except I don't know. I want to hear your perspective on one part of this subject where I don't think we currently, as it stands, have a mechanism to uh, to collectively even push the Democratic Party in the right direction and organizations, 501c3s or like activist groups that people create, uh, no matter how honest, no matter how moral, no matter how correct or how viable or how big, robust they are never end up actually moving the needle because there is no way to, hey, what's going on? There's no way to actually provide, uh, uh, (laughs) we have no, (laughs) sorry, we have no mechanism of actually forcing the the hand of the the Democratic Party, which is still beholden to the same corporate masses the Republican Party is beholden to. And I think that, I guess what I'm trying to say is, we agree, but I think uh, looking back, for example, the Black Lives Matter protests that happened all around the country and the Democratic Party's initial reaction with uh, trying to temper that movement as quickly as possible and squash it by p- uh, putting forward uh, already concessions, uh, like a concession prone uh, legislation in the form of eight can't wait, and then literally even uh, uh, d- throwing that in the trash immediately after Biden got elected. Uh, looking at that, I realized like social movements only go so far. And honestly, like the only way to do this is by uh, showcasing some kind of collective power. And that's not going to happen outside of the labor movement, in my opinion. Like uh, we can't do uh, organized like consumer based activism. I don't think it's as successful. I- I'm-, I'm still willing to try. But uh, I think the number one power that we have as, as like regular American citizens, at least, is through uh, labor through labor unions. I don't disagree with that at all. I think sort of any path to a more progressive country is going to go through a broad-based and resurgent labor movement. What I'll say just to the Democratic Party question is that the way I think about these things is it's let you got to th- I, I think you need to think about it less in terms of what the party is going to allow and more in terms of what the party system allows. And so the American party system is like unusual in that, you know, there's a Democratic Party, there's the Democratic National Convention Committee, rather, there's the Republican Party, there's the Republican National Committee. But like the party committees don't really have the power to discipline anyone. It's all sort of like an agreement, like we're going to work together. But the parties themselves are very decentralized, um, are very porous. There's many ways to enter into them and are uh, very candidate driven and candidate centric. Right. Donald I, Trump becomes. The I have a lot nominee. of I have a lot of good ideas for this part uh, internally. <laughs> I don't know if you ever I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, some of my uh, greatest takes, but I would say uh, using a real whip is one of them. Um, <laughs> the optics on that are, you know, they're not great, but also. Just putting it out there, I have an idea called the gauntlet, where there's an automatic trigger, 
if you reach an approval rating that is like below 30%, which is like whatever the congressional average is, you know what I mean? As a uh, politician, whether you're in the Senate or the House of Representatives, you automatically trigger what is known as the gauntlet, where you should, uh, you can have one champion from your state come and fight you, okay, in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the floor of the Senate or the floor of the, uh, the House of Representatives. I think that that would be like a little bit of proletarian violence in that respect, right, I think, right, right. would really force politicians to truly uh, recognize that uh, their constituents' interests are more important than the corporate benefactors that line up their pockets. Um, so before I continue, I'll say, you know, back in the 19th century, there used to be all kinds of fighting and brawls on the, on the floor of the house. That was a pretty common thing. Um, people would bring knives, guns, the whole nine yards. But uh, no, so the, the porousness of the American party system means that you know if if you were to if you were to uh show up and i live in virginia if you were to show if a bunch of people were to show up over the course of like two years and just sort of like methodically you know win every single position in the state party establishment there's like nothing the national party could do about it it's just like you congratulations you've done it you can you've run the state party now and that's more or less what the hard right did over the course of 25 years, beginning in the mid 60s and sort of really culminating with Reagan's election, kind of state by state, city by city, county by county, um, uh, taking hold of what had been moribund and uh, sclerotic party organizations and like turning them into something. And I think that option, I think that option remains available within the, the Democratic Party, which in many places is you know, moribund and hidebound and, and, you know, basically like unresponsive to anything. It wouldn't take that many people in most places to capture control of a state Democratic Party organization. Okay. Uh, that, that takes, uh, I mean, that also takes a lot of organizing, but yeah, but I think ultimately what, the you're stating, thing is what you're stating is correct though, where like that, that approach of like not being able to, uh, correctly and adequately whip your caucuses is I feel like always going to be an issue within the Democratic Party, which is why, you know, famously David Axelrod originally gave the game away a couple, uh, like a year ago almost now, where, um, or maybe a couple months ago, where he was like, well, you know, we couldn't do this under Obama too. And it was like, well, dude, you had a, <laughs> you had the filibuster proof majority. So you're basically, exp you're basically giving the game away, right? Like Biden can't say his hands are tied because he only has a 50-50, you know, uh, a tiebreaker majority in the Senate when the guy who uh, oversaw a, a filibuster proof majority is openly admitting that even then it didn't work because there's always a rotating villain and there's always someone who is going to spoil it from within. I am way more vicious and way more aggressive other than the really good idea that I just presented to you, which you uh, completely uh, avoided even uh responding to like the gauntlet the gaunt the i think that, i think the gauntlet's a fine idea okay new york times there you go it's fine if you want to write an op-ed <laughs> on that you can write an op-ed on that in the new york times it's, it's all good it's not a big deal i wonder what brett stevens would have to say about that okay that's or thomas freeman okay unrelated sorry we're not talking about other new york times op-ed writers um what i was going to say is i think that like the republican party and the way that they, they operate like look at what they did to madison cawthorn look at how quickly yeah, they were able yeah, yeah. to you know, to, to reprimand him for something that is otherwise like pretty ridiculous. Right. I mean, he's young. He, he said some really stupid things, but then immediately he was reprimanded. Right. Like the fact that Joe Manchin could still uh, sit on a committee, the energy committee is insane to me. Uh, the fact that uh, Kirsten Cinema still has uh, any kind of influence as a green Senator, the fact that she got a major layup in the form of having her name attached to a bipartisan infrastructure bill as a green senator is crazy to me. We need to punish our congresspersons harder in the Democratic Party. I think that that is one thing that they're not doing. Use the IRS. Look for conflicts of interest within Joe Manchin's businesses that uh, are not in a trust, but actually run by uh, his brother or his son, if I'm not mistaken. Like These are people who can be threatened and who can be punished. And yet, and as... Um, uh, they just the Democratic Party refuses to do so. That to me is is an, a, another obvious indication. Just like uh, you know, using the the Senate parliamentarian as a hurdle against fifteen dollar minimum wage, right? That to me is an obvious indication that the Democratic Party is not genuinely interested in progress or genuinely even interested in following on the agenda that they promised to the people that voted for them.
I don't think, you know, I don't, I do not think that much of that is necessarily wrong. I think that part of the issue, at least with the Congressional Democratic Party, the Democratic Party in Washington, is a culture of, a culture that's not of trying to fight for partisan gain. Because I think, I for me, I don't even necessarily need all these people to be like ideologically on my side. I need these people to have like a, a need to win. I want them to want to win. Yes. And like achieving partisan outcomes is more likely to lead to things that I want to happen than not. Uh, and I think that, that there's a culture of going along to get along, a culture of sort of like bipartisanship, bipartisan fetish, uh, fetishizing, um, yes. and a real culture of of corruption that you know it's pervasive in Washington that is inhibiting the ability of the Democratic Party to um, the National Democratic Party, the Democratic Party in Washington, to um, uh, be as sharp of an edge as it needs to be. My, I think, I think, I think to the extent that we disagree, it is that I think that the relative openness of the American party system means that these are things that you can sort of like push back uh, against. Like, I don't think they're sort of just like permanent parts of, of, of how things have to work. Um, but it does require, right? Like separate bases of power, um, which it, which does mean like organized labor, right? It means like it means like a labor movement that isn't so tied in with the Washington establishment, mm -hmm. and a labor movement that is willing to be antagonistic to the Democratic Party when it needs to be, uh, which means a powerful labor movement. I mean, you need these things again, independent of the parties themselves, but that can press on the parties, not unlike the way the evangelical movement has acted for the Republican Party. I think that um, with that. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go, uh, well, the thing I was going to say is like, there's obviously the fundamental difference there though, right? Like the evangelical movement does not disrupt the the pre-existing hierarchical order. Right. That's, that's the that's only, exactly that's right. the problem. They're an activist yeah. group that is inoffensive to uh, the, the centers of power. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are actually prominently a part of that group as well. And they also go along with, uh, I mean... As we both know, they they started off with a white supremacist agenda. You know, uh, Brown v. Board of Education was like the main driving force of the evangelical movement. So, like, they not only are not disrupting the centers of capital with their attitude and trying to like dramatically undermine the way that uh, you know America's corporate oligarchy operates, but on top of that, their main operating principle revolves around uh, you know upholding white supremacy, white supremacist values. So that completely goes along with uh, you know American history. And I don't know how we can, I just don't know how we can create something similar just through organized groups, especially when even funding that organized groups go completely against the main corporate benefactors that fund both the Democratic and the Republican Party. I mean, my, my, my I guess my optimistic note is that, um, you know, we, we've seen uh, in the past few presidential cycles how it's possible to raise just like enormous amounts of money through small donations and that there are ways to circumvent, right? corporate funding. And um, and ultimately, I mean, sort of, I think, I guess this makes me like a little bit of, of a Leninist. I think sort of like uh, uh, organized cadres of people working dedicatedly. Dennis Prager was right. Like, <laughs> there you, heard, you heard it first, folks. Sorry, uh, organized cadres. Can, they can uh, affect tremendous change. I mean, e even, even, even when working against sort of established hierarchies, I think that's a thing that's possible to do. And so even though the present is sort of a very bad and, and dark period. I don't I don't necessarily think all avenues for change and for progressive change are closed off. I have to I have to go like make dinner for uh, my kid. No, um, absolutely. So Thank you so thing. much for coming. Uh, is there anything <laughs> you want to promote? Anything like that? Uh, I, if, if you want to read my column, you can read my column. It's in the New York Times, uh, usually Tuesdays and Fridays. And then I have a podcast on um uh, political and military thrillers of the 90s with my friend John Gant called Unclear and Present Danger. Uh, so that that comes that comes uh, every every other Friday. So new episode new episodes actually dropping this evening on the movie Falling Down. Um, Joel Schumacher's Falling Down, starring Michael Douglas. Crazy movie. We had a good conversation about it. Dude, thank you so much for coming on, Jamal. Hopefully, we can have you on. Uh, you know, you can just pop in every now and then, whenever you want, like this. Uh, oh yeah, in the future. And I promise That'd I won't. Great. I won't compromise you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> have no have problem, a great man. day. Have a good one. All right, folks, that was Jamel Bowie of the New York Times. He also uh, appears on CBS as well. A wonderful person. Uh, not a Marxist-Leninist, okay? 
So I'm just going to point that out, uh, even though he made a joke about it. I don't want people to take that literally. Um, that was a good interview. Yeah, it was a quick, quick in and out, you know. But like, like I said, thank you, uh, Jay Bowie on uh, on on Twitter. 